whole new space race has begun. Over the next decade, the United States, Germany, England, Japan, India, China, Russia, and even a few private companies have plans to send rockets to explore the moon. They will map the lunar surface, search for clues to its origins, and find out what's there that humans can use to survive. A Russian mission will send seismic detectors into the soil to monitor moon quakes and study the flow of heat from the moon's core. A Japanese mission will use X-rays to search for rare minerals. An American mission is prospecting for water in the shadowy craters at the moon's poles. But governments aren't the only ones joining this new race to the moon. With more missions on the drawing boards and the chance to actually make money developing space businesses, private ventures are angling to supply launch or human transport services and even begin exploiting space resources like energy, materials, and the freedom from gravity itself. Private robotics teams vying for the $30 million Google Lunar X Prize are designing, building, and planning to launch rovers with video cameras to explore lunar landscapes. It's inspired by the Ortigue Prize that sent Charles Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic Ocean more than 80 years ago. That feat helped launch the civil aviation industry. The sponsors of this prize hope it will unleash the entrepreneurial spirit into space. The goal of these missions is to begin to fulfill a grand promise of the space age. To send humans back to the moon and beyond. To permanently live and work in space. NASA has unveiled its grand plan. It's a series of steps designed to build knowledge and expertise while steadily reducing the risks to human life. For now, it's the space shuttle that takes us up there. It's a big freight hauling system able to lift over 25 tons of people and machines into space with every launch. On more than two dozen flights since 1998, the shuttle has carried the International Space Station into orbit. Piece by piece, module by module, solar array by solar array, subsystem by subsystem. But the shuttle has never lived up to its promise of low-cost access to space. And now, a new NASA transportation system is slated to take over. If all goes well, Constellation will transport astronauts back to the moon, on to some of the near-Earth asteroids, eventually to Mars, and perhaps beyond. Aboard Space Station, astronauts are already preparing for longer missions. figuring out how to keep muscles and bones from weakening and thinning out through exercise and nutrition. Just as important, they're working on technologies that ensure clean air and water, shelter from solar radiation, and flexible spacesuits to work and explore in hostile environments like the moon. The surface of the moon first came into focus four centuries ago. The Italian physicist and philosopher Galileo Galilei had heard of an instrument built by Dutch opticians that could see far away things as if nearby. Galileo, in many ways the first modern scientist, 
saw this new instrument as a tool to help settle a long-standing question. What was the nature of the heavens? And what was the place of the world of men within it? The moon, to some philosophers, was seen as a perfect crystalline sphere of divine substance, free of any earthly imperfections. In 1609, to help support his science, Galileo began building and selling spy glasses to sea captains and merchant traders. But he himself took aim at the moon. He saw that it had a rocky, textured surface like the Earth, marked by myriad craters, mountains, and ocean-like depressions. The moon, he found, was far from perfect. To Galileo the scientist, it was even better, for it was clearly a world unto itself. Flash forward now to a time just about four decades ago. The astronauts of Apollo piloted down to the lunar surface for the first time. The moon, the Apollo missions discovered, is like a time capsule from the early days of the solar system. Rock samples confirmed a dramatic theory. The moon is actually made of material very similar to the surface of the Earth, likely blasted out more than four billion years ago in a violent impact with an early planet that was about the size of Mars. Moreover, the evidence showed that all those moon craters were not ancient volcanoes, as many scientists had believed, but rather they were scars from asteroid and comet impacts. Scientists began to wonder whether those impacts had endowed the moon with resources, such as water, that could be tapped to support long-term missions. The six Apollo crews that landed on the moon had all touched down near the equator. The rocks there were bone dry. In fact, all the fine dry dust became a persistent problem by getting into equipment and even sneaking into spacesuits. It turns out that the rocks brought back by Apollo were loaded with hidden treasure, iron oxide, calcium oxide, and other compounds containing oxygen. To confirm this finding, astronomers trained the powerful eyes of the Hubble Space Telescope on the lunar landscape. What could a telescope, able to see things 10 billion light years away, tell us about an object so close we can practically reach out and touch it? From its position in orbit, Hubble's instruments are able to read the ultraviolet light that's blocked by the atmosphere. Using Hubble spectrograph, Astronomers could look for the fingerprints of specific minerals. Hubble's first lunar targets, the landing sites of two Apollo missions. Samples from these sites, brought back by astronauts, contained a glassy material called ilmenite. It's rich in oxygen. Hubble's data shows that ilmenite is strewn over the areas of these landing sites. 